Okay. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yeah, so your presentation. Um, so Augusto Escalante, he's a postdoc in the group of Herrera Lab in the Neuroscience Institute in Alicante, Spain. He'll be presenting his work on how the spinal cord gates self-generated mechanical sensation. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation and for the opportunity to present here. So I'm going to be telling you about the population of spinal inhibitory neurons that are characterized by the expression of PDF1A in controlling self-generated each. So thanks to the talk of Sebastian, I can go a bit quicker on the organization of the spinal system. I will just start by introducing you how the overload of information that we are receiving in a similar fashion with all the social media we are being bombarded nowadays. The nervous system is also continuously receiving stimuli, external stimuli that has to process. Not only that, the nervous system also has to cope with self-generated sensory information that is uh, generated while we move, right? All of this information goes to the nervous system and it has, it needs to develop a way to distinguish between both. So I'm interested in uh, somatosensation and as you have seen in the previous talk by Sebastian, this uh, somatosensory modalities starts at the skin, which is not only a barrier to protect us from the external world, but is also our largest sensory organ, given that it's covered by different types of uh, receptors that transmit all, all this information, like the ones cold, heat, pain, touch, or itch, just to name a few that we are all familiar with, to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Now, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is composed by two types of neurons, like the rest of the nervous system, excitatory and inhibitory neurons. For the purpose of this talk, I'm only interested on in the inhibitory component. And thanks to the work of many labs across the, the years, we know that inhibitory neurons that populate the dorsal horn are specified by the transcription factor PTF1A and the mature neurons express the marker PAX2, another transcri transcription factor. Um, we know also that the mutants for PTF1A lose all inhibitory neurons in the dorsal horn. So that's pretty well established. And we also know where and how these populations uh, are specified and evolve and migrate through uh, embryonic development. Now, uh, until you can see that in the adult, they populate the superficial uh, layers of the, of the dorsal horn. Now, to start to unravel the function of these neurons in somatosensation, the first thing uh, I did was to perform monosynaptic rabies tracing and to, uh, in, a, in a specific PTF1A3 uh, mouse line, right? Here you can see how sensory neurons in the DRGs are labeled after injecting the modified rabies virus in the spinal cord. Using a battery of markers, and we're not gonna spend much time, we saw that most of the inputs that the PTF1A cells are receiving are related to touch, so to light mechanosensory information, and not much pain or proprioceptive uh, sensor information. They also receive uh, motor-related uh, information coming mostly from the motor cortex and from the gigantocellular nuclei. But we also saw that these neurons uh, make around the 86% of all of this special type of synapses that many uh, neurons establish in the dorsal spinal cord that it's directly on the terminals of the sensory afferents before they reach the, the target, their target neurons, which is a way to control the somatosensory input uh, information into the spinal cord. So, in order to work with this population specifically in the spinal cord, we have used an ablation strategy that has been previously published by the Goulding lab in which uh, cells that express both CRE and the another recombinase FLIP leads to the expression of the receptor for the diphtheria toxin. Here we cross these animals with double PTF1A CRE, CDX2 FLIPO. This mouse line allows us to gain uh, a spatial specificity, given that it's only expressed in the caudal part of the body, so that we can get expression of the uh, diphtheria toxin receptor 
only in our PTF1A3 cells in the spinal cord and not, for example, in the cerebellum where PTF1A is also expressed. Then upon delivery of the diphtheria toxin, we can eliminate those cells. Now, what we got was an ablation efficiency of around 40% of all the PDF1A uh, CRE derived neurons when we evaluated using a tomato reporter, and a similar decrease of around 36% in the number of PAX2 neurons in the dorsal horns of the spinal cord. Now, what happens with these animals? You can see in this video very clearly, they develop a very intense each phenotype. So these animals scratch all the time which is around 22 times per minute, which compared to a control that scratches around 0 0.2 times per minute, is really crazy. They scratch around 100 times more than control animals. Uh, however, and interestingly, what is known of, of, as uh, chemical itch is not affected. So if you inject any uh, pruritogen into the skin, the animals will not scratch more than controls. Uh, also, no other somatosensory modality that we could test for was affected, except for the uh, sensitivity of the hairy skin. So if we apply very light uh, air paths into the uh, hairy back skin, we see that PTF1A ablated animals respond more strongly than control animals. So their hairy skin's uh, sensitivity, sensitivity was higher than in controls. So to gain a better understanding of how this phenotype uh, works, we uh, video recorded animals continuously for through uh, several days, both during the dark and light phases. And we con calculated uh, how much these animals were scratching and when. So as you can see here, animals were more active during the dark than during the light phases, both for controls and updated animals, as is expected from mice that are no nocturnal animals. But we also observed that both controls, but also the PDF1A ablated animals, scratched more during the dark phase. That gave us an idea that probably the uh, scratching phenotype was correlated in some manner with the level of activity of the animal. The more they would move, the more they would scratch. In order to test this, this we just did a simple experiment that was to uh, restrict the ability of the animals to move. So we just put them in this plastic enclosure that we have used before for the air paths delivery. And as you can see here, the animals can move, around, can change size, they can groom, they can do stuff, but they cannot walk. And as you can see, the same animals before and after putting them in this enclosure, the scratching goes down almost to uh, control uh, levels, giving us the idea that probably it's actually the uh, mechanical stimulus that they encounter in their home cage, what is triggering this, um, this scratching phenotype. To test this, we just did a very simple experiment. It was to reduce the amount of mechanosensory cues that they find in their own environment, that it's the laboratory home cage. So we just remove all the bedding material from the cages and we quantify the scratching before and after. And as you can see, we found a 40, around a 40% 40 reduction in the amount of scratching that the PTF1A ablated animals experience when you reduce this, what we can call mechanosensory landscape to which they are exposed. Uh, to confirm this idea, we explore the possibility that this kind of stimulation would, be, would lead to more activation in PTF1A ablated spinal cords than in control. And for that, putting the animals under anesthesia, I stimulated just the hairs on the back of the animal trying to avoid touching the skin. And we kept the animals under anesthesia to prevent any other kind of stimuli to uh, affect these animals. And then we performed CFOS analysis to measure, to have an idea of the activation uh, of neurons in the spinal cord. As you will see in these images, in these images, but probably better in the higher magnification ones, the dorsal horn of the PDF1A ablated animals were enriched in CFOS inactive uh, neurons, while the ventral horn that does not receive this type of light mechanosensory stimuli was uh, unchanged. So in order to test a gain of function approach, kind of, uh, we reasoned that increasing the activity of an inhibitory population in a otherwise uh, um, part of the spinal cord that it's normally under very uh, strong inhibition would not lead to a clear uh, phenotype. So we decided to use the GRPR 
population of spinal neurons that since many years has been recognized as the uh, population of neurons that are both necessary and sufficient to signal each in the spinal cord. So we used grpr Cree uh, animals combined with an intersectional genetics uh, chemogenetic activator. So uh, the cells that are both flip and Cree positives will express the channel HM3D that are activated upon delivery of CNO. And uh, we would measure the scratching in these animals. So in control animals, of course, there was no change between vehicle and CNO activa activation. <clears throat> The same was true for when we activated just PTF1A cells. When we activated grpr Cree cells alone, we saw a high uh, increase in scratching as was expected. And when we activated at the same time in the same animal PTF1A and grpr cells, what we saw was a clear reduction, reduction in the scratching phenotype, confirming what we uh, our hypothesis, that is that PTF1A Cree cells are uh, in place contacting uh, presynaptically the mechanosensory inputs that come into the GRPR each circuit in the spinal cord. So upon ablation of these cells, the simple movement of the animal around uh, during their normal life will lead to activation of GRPR cells that will lead in turn to scratching. With this, I just want to thank the Rudiger Kleins lab uh, in the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology and all the people that contributed mouse lines and of course the funding and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you also, very nice talk. Um, so again, place your questions in the Q&A. Um, I sort of wanted, had a question about the phenotype. It seemed very interesting to me when I'm yeah. thinking about sort of this cancellation of self-initiated sensory inputs in other domains, why is the animal interpreting this as itch, right? As opposed to another sort of somatosensory sensation that's not, you know, itch. Yeah. Um, well, the short answer is, we don't know, obviously. Uh, the long answer is uh, GRPR neurons receive uh, we have quantified that in the paper, uh, receive uh, abundant input from mechanosensory, uh, mechanical sensory afferents. So if that, those afferents are disinhibited, that is going to lead to activation of the neuron. And then of course, to uh, what GRPR neuron signals is each. So that's the behavioral consequence. Um, then, I need to stress out, we are removing only like 40% of the PTF1A cells, and this is the phenotype we see. So the other 60% of PTF1A neurons probably are targeting other types of fibers, right, of sensory fibers. So I would not be surprised if in that case, we would see a different type of behavior as the output of, their, of losing these, these neurons. So, how dependent do you think this is on the mouse generating the movement? So if you force the movement on the mouse itself or impose the movement, you think you would see the same phenotype? Yeah, uh, I was trying to perform that kind of experiments that I put in the animal on a treadmill and that kind of, of stuff. Uh, I never managed to make it work because of course the animal are anxious for other reasons, the apparatus, the everything. Uh, so it was uh, pretty tough. So the best that we could come up with was just to record the animals in their natural uh, environment, that is the, their home cage, and just see how they behave there. And then we see this correlation between uh, movement of the animal, as you see, natural, spontaneous, and the scratching. If we, I could find a way, well, there would be a way like stimulating optogenetically some regions in the brainstem that are uh, correlated, that have been demonstrated to induce walking, then we could perhaps uh, answer your question better. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? One last one for me then. Um, sure. What would happen if you shaved the mouse, removed its hair? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did that experiment actually. 
uh, not shaving completely the animal because that's, that's tough. Uh, so I was doing an experiment in which I would shave one half of the animal, of the back of the animal. And surprisingly, what happens there is that the animals scratch exactly at the interface between the region that doesn't have hairs and the ones that where the hairs are starting. So that region would develop quickly uh, wounds from the scratching of the animal, just in wild type animals. So apparently having a part of the skin in which you are having this interface between no uh, hair input and hair input, it's enough already to trigger this scratching response. Probably the animals are detecting their own hairs now contacting more than now naked uh, part of the skin. But we stopped the experiments when wild type animals behaved exactly the same as, as already developed this phenotype. I mean. Thank you. Very, very interesting finding. Uh, I want to thank again all our speakers. Uh, for